The ruin of Castle Urquhart in the highlands of northern Scotland dominates the shore of a lake shrouded by mystery. The murky waters have hidden a persistent and puzzling tale for 1,400 years. The lake is called Loch Ness. It is said that here lives a monster that can make the surface of a lake boil with foam. What is beneath the surface of the loch? We will be closer to knowing the answer. Closer for having discovered new evidence in search of the Loch Ness Monster. In search of cameras record a long trail of bubbles, evidence of something huge passing beneath our lens. Leonard Nimoy. Few of the great mysteries we will explore in this series are as compelling as the accounts of an unknown beast which lives in a picturesque Scottish lake. A compelling mystery because in spite of the many sightings over hundreds of years, there was little evidence until recently to support the possibility of the creature being real. Tonight, we'll take a hard look at the new evidence. Loch Ness is remarkable in many ways. The lake was created by a great movement of the Earth's crust. It is open to the sea at both ends, through a series of lesser lakes, rivers, and in more recent times, large canals. Loch Ness is wedged between mountains, only a mile wide, but 24 miles long. Its depth may exceed 900 feet in some places, but no one to this day knows for sure how deep the lake is. People have made their lives by the lake for thousands of years. Others have come for just one reason, to glimpse a monster. Some are more serious about getting a look at the creature than others. Scientists by the expedition full roam the lake. From MIT and the Academy of Applied Science they come. The National Geographic Society scours for underwater camera positions. Scientific associations in England are hard at work too. An old abbey by the shore of the lake is where the quest has its origins. St. Columba came to Loch Ness in the 6th century to convert barbarians. He founded a Benedictine order that maintains the abbey today. And as Father Gregory recalls, St. Columba also founded a legend. St. Columba came up this way according to St. Adamnan, who wrote his life in the next century, that's about the 4th century. Um, he came up from Iona with a few of his monks and they came up the chain of locks, Loch Oish, Loch Lochy, on his way to convert the king of the Picts, northern Picts, King Brood. Adamnan recounts that at the end of Loch Ness, where the Ness flows into the sea, they just come up to the end, they were going to cross the Ness, and a man was swimming across the river and this great serpent thing, a beast, appeared 
And St. Damon says the holy man, <coughs> the great sign of the cross and a loud voice, drove it off so they didn't uh, do any harm to him. But we don't know how much truth that is in that, but that's the first, uh, first uh, account we have uh, of, this, of this strange thing that's in the loch. Perhaps a modern camera caught a descendant of the great serpent described by St. Columba in the 6th century. Early in the morning of April 1st, 1934, a London surgeon of impeccable reputation snapped this picture. A lumberjack working near the lake took this picture in 1951. An American scientist produced a view of the creature with an underwater camera. The murkiness of Loch Ness obscures the shot. But even some of the most skeptical investigators consider the picture positive evidence that a large animal exists in the lake. Motion picture film was made in 1966 by another Loch Ness investigator. The film was examined by Royal Air Force photo intelligence experts and certified to be genuine. 1,400 years of recorded sightings that began with the experience of a Christian missionary in the 6th century. Father Gregory's own experience was not unlike that reported by the saint who founded his order. We had an organist friend up from London, and um, we were standing on the edge of the lock on the stone jetty, looking across the bay on the right, and we were suddenly surprised. There were no boats, first of all, there were no boats visible at all suddenly noticed a tremendous commotion in the bay and we couldn't see what was causing this at first and then we were fairly staggered to see a little further on a huge neck emerge we would both agreed about seven feet at least above the water at a slight angle moving along slowly for about 17 seconds we estimated and then it went down we didn't see any of the body but this huge this height out of the water was was extraordinary in fact, this organist said to me, he said, if I hadn't been there, he'd have felt like running. It gave him such a queer feeling. Mm. Sergeant Henderson is one of the senior constables patrolling the little communities around Loch Ness. One patrol put him squarely at the heart of the mystery of the lake. And about halfway between Fort Augustus and here, we um, saw something in the water. We thought it was a boat in difficulties. So we rushed down. When we got there to the water, we saw these two fins about 20 feet apart, about four feet out of the water, I would say, traveling towards Invermorris and stayed up for five or six seconds, uh, submerged, came back up again, and stayed up for another 10 seconds, then submerged finally, didn't come back up again. Now, the water was quite calm at the time, but when things submerged, and finally there was a terrific wash came onto the shore. Alex Campbell was a waterman on Loch Ness most of his working life. Well, during my working life, we'd, we were responsible for the preservation of the salmon stocks in these areas. Glen Morrison, Glen Gary, Loch Ness, and all the other adjacent adjoining rivers. That was the main job. Then there was the hatchery work. I was expecting a run of fresh salmon. Because as soon as they reach their home river, they jump and cavort about as though they were glad to be home. I was looking across, and then just off the Abbey Bolt House, which is across there, and about 250 yards from where I was standing, suddenly there was a most terrific upsurge of water. Then the long, tapering neck small head which was turning very cruel, I should say scared looking, and a huge humped body which I estimated at 30 feet long. I just, and I shut my eyes three times to make quite sure that I wasn't seeing something, that I, you know, it didn't exist. However, then I heard the noise of the engine of two fishing trawlers that had just, just come, come out, out from, from the, the canal, canal blocks and were heading for Loch Ness. I said to myself, oh, this is going to be interesting. And meanwhile, this, 
the head was even more excited, you see, the animal. I said to myself, this is going to be very exciting because as soon as the bow, the first trawler, comes within my line of vision, it'll also come within the animal's line of vision. Well, that duly happened. And as soon as the bow of the first trawler appeared, oh, a terrific pl plunge into the depths. That surge was fantastic. Could this be Alex Campbell's monster? Some theorize that such creatures could have been trapped in Loch Ness during its primordial past, living relics of a lost world. The notion that creatures from the dawn of life on this planet still live among us is irresistible to many. It is proof they seek. For Ted Holliday, proof would be film of the monster, close up and in sharp focus. I'd been up that particular morning for about five o'clock watching the lock. When Mrs. Pickett finally came out to wash breakfast dishes about nine o'clock, I strolled over to have a word with her. Um, I left my camera behind me and I walked about 50 yards to chat with I turned and uh, looked across the lock. Well, actually, I looked over Mrs. Pickett's shoulder to a point about a quarter of a mile to the left of the Clanton Hotel across that side. And I saw this huge black mass it undulated into three humps proceeding from right to left. He was going at a fair speed, and the water was swelling up from the front of it in a big white wash. And I said to Mrs. Pickett, can you see that? She said she could. I said, well, watch it while I get the camera. And I rushed and grabbed the camera, and immediately a voice shouted after me, oh, it's gone down. Well, I put a binoculars on the spot, and there was a huge whirlpool, as though something had submerged into the lock, a huge patch about 50 yards across. Hundreds of cameras would be trained on the lock this summer. The In Search Of camera would be among them and would capture a most remarkable event. The summer of 1976 was to be the beginning of the big push to find conclusive evidence that huge creatures live in Loch Ness. Three major expeditions would prowl the lake. Some men, like Robert Rhines of the Academy of Applied Sciences, were veterans of the chase. A veteran who could recall being hooked by a tantalizing glimpse of something big and unexplained, moving serenely just out of his reach. Well, uh, the first and only time uh, was in, uh, I believe, 1972, in June, near the summer solstice. Uh, we were with uh, Wing Commander Carey and his wife, my wife, it was, I think we were having coffee at their house, nothing stronger. Yes. And indeed, uh, Basil Carey said, I, I say that, that, that doesn't look like an upturned boat. Out we rushed uh, to the, the embankment uh, near their house, and we looked down in the middle of Earth Hot Bay. And there, though it was, oh, 10, 10.30 in the evening, it was still quite light. There was a slight rain, but we unmistakably saw a, a giant hump uh, in the water, move slowly out in the bay, turn around and come back, and then submerge. Uh, we had some telescopes, and we took turns, uh, not talking to each other, but looking through the telescopes and, and deliberately taking measurements with a 53-foot fishing vessel that was there. After all this was over, I went into the carrier's kitchen and taped what I had seen, the dimensions I thought I had seen, and then I individually taped them, and we were in unanimous view that uh, we had seen some 22 feet of back of something that intellectually to each of us that couldn't be anything other than a big animal, and about four to six feet out of the water at the apex. How long will you keep searching? Well, we're certainly going to stay here until we do find out one way or another uh, by uh, photographic and sonar evidence uh, what these things may be. Maybe this year, maybe next year, goodness knows how long, but uh, we're going to stick it out. Adrian Shine is another veteran of the hunt, but he has chosen to track his quarry at Loch Morar, just above Loch Ness. Monsters have been seen here, too, and the relative clarity of the water in Morar may give shine an advantage. We are laying out this year cameras, television cameras, beneath the surface in order to carry out a constant surveillance over some three months. We can lay the cameras down to 60 feet beneath the water and hope to get a silhouette of the creature passing over the top. We can get ranges underwater of nearly 100 feet. 
We have uh, some conventional cameras as well, conventional 35 millimeter cameras, but the video technique, in my opinion, is better because we have an immediate, an immediate uh, record. We don't have to process film, and of course we get a moving record as well. This tape uh, was taken with the camera at 60 feet below the surface, and there is a diver at 20 feet from the camera. Uh, this is followed by a further tape of the, uh, with the same setup and the diver at 40 feet from the camera and going up to the surface. You can see that, therefore, that we have at the surface at least 60 to 70 feet across the surface under surveillance. The National Geographic Society has decided to focus its efforts on Loch Ness. By carefully charting the lake bottom with sonar and positioning cameras at strategic points beneath the surface, the geographic scientists hope to overcome the handicap of poor visibility. The task is to guess where the monster is most likely to be, then lure it to the camera. The geographic team knows that Loch Ness was formed by an upheaval of the Earth's crust and that the trench created by that upheaval was enlarged by glaciers. The glaciers created a U-shaped bottom to the lake, but they did not completely obliterate the deep valleys which are characteristic of the region. So there are hidden depths to Loch Ness, depths capable of sheltering huge animals. National Geographic's Dr. Bob Ballard thinks these deep channels are his best bet. But we're making the assumption that the monster would come into the bay using these deep channels. That it would like to stay on the bottom and in as deep a water as it can to get in near the river where there must be a lot of biological activity because of the river outflow. So we wanted to pick a spot where we could set up the camera close to a deep channel. Well, to do that, we had to survey it. So we've been went around the bay and put a series of reference points and then sitting on the castle we shot in with a with a compasses and positioned these reference points and then we use those reference points to run back and forth across the bay with the ship measuring the echo sounding we figure that if we put our camera rig in about 120 feet of water we're going to be within 500 feet of one of these deep channels you take the rope into your boat and you worry about deep National Geographic will position its cameras beneath the surface of the lake, suspended from sea anchors. The likelihood that the animals can be successfully photographed from the surface is being discounted. Emery Kristoff is the expedition's chief photographer. We've discounted pretty much that it would be a mammal. And we would figure if it was a mammal and be air breathing, there would be more sightings of the creature. We feel then if we are dealing with a uh, amphibian or a reptile or something of the, of the fish nature, we have a creature that uh, hunts by, by listening and picks up vibrations in the water. So we, we've tailored our program really to this. The scientists are listening, too, with sensitive underwater microphones. Recordings have been made of the normal sounds of the lock at rest, at night or during the day, when boat traffic is at a minimum. They are tranquil sounds. Another recording was made late in the afternoon of July 5th. It was anything but tranquil. There was no way to tell for sure what the underwater microphones were picking up. But at about the same time the recording was made, and in about the same location, the In Search Of cameras recorded something even more remarkable. A long trail of bubbles breaking on the surface of the lock. There were no boats nearby. There were no divers. But something beneath the surface of the lock was creating a large disturbance and it provides the most convincing photographic evidence gathered this year that the monster may in fact be real, that something big and alive 
was moving in front of our camera, just beneath the surface of Loch Ness. Monster sightings have been reported in other lakes, in Ireland, Canada, the Scandinavian countries, and elsewhere. All of these sightings occurred in roughly the same northern latitude occupied by Loch Ness. Dr. Nicholas Hutton of the Smithsonian Institution is a preeminent paleontologist on intimate terms with our world's dim past. If there is something living in Loch Ness, what could it possibly be? Uh, from my own point of view, I just don't think there is anything in Loch Ness, but there is an interesting theory put forth by Dr. Roy Mackle of the University of Chicago, who argues that uh, there may in fact be a population of giant eels. The point being that we know that Loch Ness supports a good population of salmon and eels, and eels, for example, live most of their lives in fresh water, but they go out to sea to reproduce, and then the young come back to the parent waters. Uh, certain individuals will fail to mature sexually and in consequence don't go to sea. They just live on in the fresh water and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and Mackle thinks that this might have happened, might be what's happening in Loch Ness, in which you have a few uh, resident uh, eels which have gotten uh, grown to enormous size. He suggests 20 feet, but he also uh, admits that uh, Size is extremely difficult to estimate, and uh, maybe 12 or 15 feet now might be more like it. If there is anything in Loch Ness that we don't know about uh, in ordinary scientific terms, it's got to be something like Mackle's eels. We now have volumes of data on the Loch Ness monsters, and none of the investigators involved disputes the probability that a creature lives in Loch Ness, and all of them agree that the intensive effort may soon turn up the monster of the lake. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft, unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists, researchers, and a group of highly skilled technicians.